Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know uh, not everybody's here. I apologize for the scheduling mix-up uh, last week. Uh, I've done a lot to sort it out that you guys uh, could be here and that I could be here today. And then we'll have the last lecture is next Thursday morning, same, uh, same early uh, hour. Um, so what we're mostly going to talk about today is gradient echoes. We talked through in, in the previous lecture sort of all the different sort of components that make an MR system. And then we learned something about image contrast and spin echoes. Uh, and today what we're going to talk about is gradient echoes, and that's going to lead us to K-space. Have you guys heard of K-space? Does anyone sort of kind of know what K-space is? Okay, so this is going to be your first introduction to that, and, and we'll, we'll sort of approach it in slightly different ways. Uh, but K-space is the domain in which we actually acquire the data. So we don't actually acquire images. Uh, you might think that like a camera maybe directly acquires an image onto you know, film or a digital sensor. Uh, in uh, magnetic resonance imaging, what we actually acquire is so-called K-space, and it's this uh, Fourier transform representation of the object itself. And why we do things that way is a little bit confusing, but I want to give you at least some insight as to what that's uh, all about. So the sort of last maybe third of this lecture is going to be focused on giving you some, some understanding and intuition for what is uh, K-space. Um, what I wanted to do, especially since we had a break of about a week uh, between the lectures, is just give a quick kind of overview uh, of, of where we stand at this point and what, hopefully what we've uh, covered and hopefully what you're um, coming to understand. And so one of the first things we did is we had a hardware teardown, just sort of looking at what is inside the scanner. And two things that are important in this figure here are the so-called main coil or the B0 coil. And you just see a bunch of windings of wire. It's just what we call a solenoid, wires that loop around in a, in a, in a uh, 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 helix around the scanner. And then those wires, those main coil wires, are in a so-called cryostat. And the cryostat's filled with liquid helium. And that keeps everything cold and superconducting and lets us operate this as a superconducting electromagnet. What's the purpose of the B0 field? We sort of had one keyword that we were using. We call it the polarizer, right? So it was what's responsible for generating this sort of spin-up, spin-down state, which we'll talk about in just a second. But without a B0 field, all your spins are just disorganized, right? They're pointing in every possible direction. Why would it be otherwise? Um, the other component in here to focus on is what we call the body coil, sometimes called a transmit coil because it transmits an RF pulse or it transmits the B1 pulse. Uh, we sometimes use it as a receiving coil, meaning we listen for an echo and can record the echo. But primarily, the so-called body coil is used for transmitting the B1 field. What, is the, what does an RF pulse do to our spins? What's the one keyword? Yeah, I see, I see hands going, right? Yeah, so we tip the spins over, right? Or we call it excitation, right? We excite the spins. We're exciting them into a state where we can actually measure something because we only are sensitive to measuring transverse magnetization. So we have to tip the spins over at least a little bit. And then another important hardware component that we talked about were the gradients. And so we know we have an X gradient, we have a Y gradient, and we have a Z gradient. What was the function of the gradients? One key thing. What is it? Uh, they will heat up, but what, what function do they serve for imaging? Spatial encoding, right? So we're going to talk more about gradients today. Gradients can change the local Larmor frequency, and that means we can start controlling the Larmor frequency, and that actually is kind of the key that underlies um, our ability to actually do imaging. It's not an obvious thing, uh, but I'll try to give you some intuition for that again today. Um, so we have to remember also this funny thing about Zeeman splitting, right? So the B0 field is always on, right? We don't turn it off. We don't turn it back on when we come in in the morning. It's always on unless there's a real problem with the system. And when we turn it on uh, and we introduce a sample to the scanner, everything is generally filled with water, uh, people and so forth. Uh, but it turns out only a very small number of spins uh, are spin up relative to spin down. So this really unusual sort of quirk of quantum mechanics means some things are spin up and some things are spin down. And if it were perfectly equal, if we had uh, you know, uh, uh, a million spins up and a million spins down, the, all of NMR wouldn't work. We have to have a slight imbalance there. And it turns out, because of thermodynamics, uh, we do have just a tiny, tiny, tiny bias 
of spins in the spin-up state. Uh, so it's this kind of quirk of physics that, that makes this sort of all possible in the first place. Um, but it also means MRI is a relatively low sensitivity technique. So if you compare it to PET, PET might be sensitive to things in the micromolar or even like nanomolar range for identifying the location of a specific tracer that targets uh, a tumor or something like this. MRI is really low sensitivity. Um, it's only kind of parts per million, right? Not nanomolar, not picomolar, right? Parts per million. So it's, uh, um, uh, it's, it's not a real sensitive technique. So here's a, a, an animation we saw before that pulls together both B1 excitation and subsequent relaxation. And so if we go back, here's the excitation process where the spins tip down, they process in the transverse plane, and then they wobble back to their equilibrium. And that process of uh, exciting spins produces transverse magnetization that's useful for forming images, but that's not a stable configuration, right? Why would the spins stay tipped over? They want to realign themselves with the B0 field, and they do that limited only by some relaxation. So they don't do it instantaneously, but they do it uh, according to their time constant of relaxation. And what underlies a lot of... Uh, um, uh, utility of MR imaging is that every tissue has different relaxation properties and consequently different rates of relaxation give us uh, image contrast. We can, we saw this a little bit before, we can turn on different gradients, right? We can turn on, in this case, the red gradient as an X gradient, the green gradient as a Y gradient, and we can control spins by doing so. So if we turn on both of these gradients, then maybe this spin over here goes really, really fast, uh, in this case counterclockwise, and this spin goes really, really fast, but clockwise. Uh, remarkably, we can create a, a plane of spins, what we call an isochromat, right? Uh, and so simultaneous gradients create an arbitrary isochromat plane. We can steer this plane around. And now if we have an RF pulse tuned to this particular frequency, then we'll excite this specific plane. And that's the slice that we'll be imaging. If we change the frequency such that it's tuned to these spins here, then we'll actually be exciting that slice instead. So by slightly changing the frequency of our RF pulse, we can hit different spins and, and consequently steer it to the slice we're interested in. Now as a user, you don't have to do all of that. As a user, there's a graphical user interface, you draw a line, and then behind the scenes, there's a bunch of calculations that say, oh, okay, these are the gradients we need, and this is the frequency we need for our RF pulse, and then we can excite that particular slice. So gradients are, are, are the key uh, uh, to uh, spatial encoding for MR. Um, we also know that Faraday's law of induction plays a really important role here. So once we've excited spins uh, and they have some component of transverse magnetization, that component of transverse magnetization can be detected in a coil and then recorded as an oscillation on our, uh, on our uh, nearby computer. And this is simply Faraday's law of induction. If you have a magnet and you move it back and forth relative to a loop of wire, you'll see a voltage being induced uh, in that system. In, in our case, it's actually water molecules that behave like little tiny magnets. And as they're spinning around very quickly at the Larmor frequency, they pass by, so to speak, uh, one of the coils. It could be a, a knee coil or it could be a head coil or um, a breast coil, body coil, all kinds of coils. And that leads to uh, a measurable signal that can be recorded and then subsequently interpreted uh, uh, as some imaging information, which we're kind of building our way up to. Uh, and the trick, of course, is to encode spatial information and image contrast into this thing we call an echo. Right? We have spin echoes, which we talked about a little bit already, and we're going to learn today about gradient echoes. Now, I said this just a second ago, but, you know, again, one of the reasons that we're here at all is because different tissues have different relaxation time constants. And so we talk about T1 and T2 relaxation. T1 governed a specific component of the magnetization. It was the X, the Y, or the Z. Do you remember which one? T1 is Z. So T1 is about longitudinal recovery. How slowly does the magnetization return when we measure and just look at the Z component. T2 relaxation is the other one, right? T2 relaxation is the transverse relaxation time constant, and it governs or relates to how quickly the transverse magnetization decays. So we have T1 recovery of the Z magnetization, 
and we have T2 decay with the transverse magnetization. And again, just showing two different tissues uh, here, gray matter and white matter. Gray matter and white matter have different T1s, and so we can tune a pulse sequence to give us sensitivity or contrast between those two particular tissues, or not. Uh, and we can also tune our image to have contrast uh, based on T2 mechanisms. So these plots here just come from uh, the block equations. We're, we won't review that today, but it basically just shows us that um, uh, our longitude, so let's, let's, uh, let's do a little thought experiment here. So we're going to talk about what happens to the MZ magnetization with these solid lines here, right? How do I end up in a state of zero longitudinal magnetization? What do I have to do to my spin? How far do I tip it until I have no Z component? 90, right? So when I get all the way down to 90, then I have no Z magnetization. And in fact, and I heard it, we can keep tipping, right? We can tip to a 180, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So the idea that I'm plotting here is that we've saturated both white and gray matter. We've tipped white and gray matter over, so there's no Z magnetization. And now they recover at their individual relaxation time constant rates, right? White matter recovers uh, quickly and gray matter recovers, sorry, gray matter recovers quickly and white matter recovers a little bit more slowly. And the whole trick to MRI is to play a pulse, maybe it's a saturation pulse like this, and then to time the imaging experiment so that we have contrast. You can see that there's differences in signal intensity kind of in the middle here, and there's less signal intensity difference early on. So now we just have to time our experiment so we're getting the right exposure, and we can get T1 and T2 contrast or signal differences between white matter and gray matter if we happen to design the experiment the right way and wait the right amount of time. Um, on the other sort of end of the scale, we have T2 relaxation. So this is how quickly the, the T2, uh, sorry, the transverse magnetization decays. How do I end up with full transverse magnetization? How do I get the most transverse magnetization? What RF pulse? I'm going down. What am I going to have the most on my X and Y plane? After 90, right? So I tip again by a 90, and then again I have my most or maximum amount of transverse magnetization. Now that transverse magnetization is not stable, right? We had to excite it to generate transverse magnetization, and it wants to just decay away. And it does decay away according to a T2 time constant, which are pretty short, right? 100 milliseconds. Um, that means it's, and it's exponential decay, right? So after about five um, T2s, the signal is basically gone uh, entirely, and you see this here. By the time you get out to 500 milliseconds, the transverse magnetization is totally decayed. So again, the idea is that image contrast is all about taking a snapshot or a picture at just the right time, and uh, we saw a couple examples of that. The sequence that we spent the most time talking about last time was the spin echo sequence. And so it starts off like this. We've got bulk magnetization at equilibrium that just points along the z-axis, points straight up and down. And the first thing that the spin echo sequence does is plays a 90-degree pulse. So we just did this little thought experiment ourselves. The 90-degree pulse tips everything over into the transverse plane. Now that magnetization is acted upon by lots of things, right? There's the B0 field, and the B0 field will call it, cause it to process. A lot of times when we make these movies, we don't worry about that processional behavior because it's happening so fast. It's 64 megahertz. It would be turning around millions of times per second, and it's rather distracting. And so we just get rid of it. We, we, we call it demodulating it. So here, we're just looking at what happens to the spins, but without the, the, the apparent Larmor frequency. So we play a 90-degree pulse, and that tips everything down. But all of those spins are at slightly different spatial positions, right? They're all somewhere in your pixel or your voxel. And as a consequence, they see slightly different fields and process at slightly different frequencies. So they're kind of fanning out a little bit because of what we call off resonance, right? You're, if you were on resonance, everything would stick together, but everything's just a little bit off resonance, and it tends to fan out like this. And the magic of the spin echo sequence comes in the middle here with this one, what we call 180 pulse, or importantly, we call it a refocusing pulse. And the refocusing pulse tips everything over like a pancake, right? We flip it over like this, and now those same sources of off-resonance actually push the spins back together again. The, sources, the, the reason things are off-resonant, it's still there. The field is imperfect for some reason, and that's still there. But because you flipped it over like a pancake, at least for a short period of time, those same sources of off-resonance actually push things together, and we're able to form an echo. Uh, 
And so this is the spin echo sequence uh, all together. And again, it's the 90 pulse to tip things over. Things dephase because of off resonance. There's a 180 pulse to flip everything over like a pancake. And then those same sources of off resonance push things together. And as they come together, we form a nice strong or sharp echo. And we're recording that signal uh, to help us ultimately form an image. And so that was the spin echo sequence. And what we learned about with the spin echo sequence was there was uh, a couple things that we could control with regards to the timing. We can control the TE, and the TE is really re related to T2 uh, decay. And we can control the TR, and the TR is really related to T1 relaxation. And so in this simple sequence here, we play a 90, we play a 180, we record the echo. And one echo gives us only part of our image, so we actually need to get hundreds of echoes to form the whole image. We'll talk about that later today. Uh, but after we have repeated this same experiment maybe hundreds of times, uh, hundreds of TRs, then we have enough imaging information to build up this image here. And in this case, given that we have a, a short TE, um, 10 milliseconds is a short TE for spin echo, and it looks like at least we have a pretty long TR, uh, so short TE and a long TR gives us what we call a proton density weighted image. The image is kind of flat in terms of its image contrast. It's weighted by uh, the sort of presence or absence of protons. Uh, white matter and gray matter have very similar concentrations of, of water. Um, but you can see clearly air spaces uh, and bone and then of course the air outside of the subject all appearing dark because they have really low proton densities. One of the tricks that we then learned about was that we could use what we call an inversion pulse. And so we have an inversion recovery spin echo sequence. And in this case here, we have three sequence parameters that we can control. It's still a spin echo sequence, so there's still a TE and there's still a TR. The TR is just fundamentally how often you repeat this block, right? Uh, the TR could in fact uh, extend past, well, it, it's the time, in this case, it's the time between one inversion pulse and then uh, the next inversion pulse, which maybe comes you know, many seconds later. And so the idea with this sequence is still that it uses uh, the inversion, uh, sorry, the spin echo sequence. It's still an excitation pulse. It's still a refocusing pulse. And that still gives rise to an echo. But before we do any of this, we play an inversion pulse. And the inversion pulse takes all of our spins, whether it's white matter, gray matter, fat, CSF, doesn't matter, and we invert it. We tip everything upside down. And now they're going through that longitudinal recovery, and we time our imaging just for the sweet spot, for the contrast that we want, form a spin echo, and we get the image contrast that we want. And the idea, at least in this particular example here, is that really long TIs, TIs are the inversion time, we can use those to example, uh, for example, to null CSF, uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid has a really long T1, so it recovers very, very slowly. And so we have to wait a long period of time for CSF's signal to be close to zero and then form our image. Uh, and if we do so, this is not maybe the, the best example, but it's a pretty good example of CSF and the ventricles here being quite dark and otherwise having uh, some T1 contrast. Okay, so that's a, that was what I called the lightning review, right? That was the 10 slides that just tried to get us back warmed up again for uh, lots of complicated words and concepts. Questions about sort of um, where, we're, where we're at? I know it's a lot. Okay, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep rolling and then uh, we'll try to take a break if we can close to eight. Um, uh, we'll see how we go. So uh, again, today's lecture is kind of two things. It's, it's, it's sort of introducing you to the concepts of gradient echoes and the things that we can do with gradient echoes. And then at the very end, we'll try to spend some time talking about case space. Case space, again, is the... Is the um, the information that we actually acquire to help us form uh, an image. One of the things, unfortunately, you'll learn uh, as you study MR is that there are, are a lot of acronyms and there are a lot of overlapping acronyms. Um, and so today what I'm really going to talk about is spoiled gradient echoes. And this will all make sense in about 10 slides, or hopefully it'll make sense in about 10 slides. If you go work with a particular manufacturer sequence, they're going to call spoiled gradient echo imaging by different names, and it's it's incredibly annoying. Um, so if you work on a GE system, a Philips system, or whatever, uh, they have trade names, uh, uh, which I, which I abhor. Uh, but it's just the state of things. There are sort of nice PDFs online that are sort of these lookup tables where if you know it by one name, you can figure out what else it goes by. Uh, so anyway, I list these here just in case it's uh, useful for clarity. Uh, 
there's another sequence we won't have much time to talk about today, which is another uh, another gradient echo-like sequence, which is called balanced steady state free precession. Uh, and, and clinically, at least, you'll certainly encounter that. Uh, uh, we'll see if we have time to talk about it possibly in the last lecture. So again, the main focus today is on spoiled gradient echo. What are some advantages and disadvantages? Well, this is a great technique for fast imaging. Uh, why is it a good technique for fast imaging? Well, I'll show you in a little bit, but it has a short TE and a short TR, and especially shorter with regards to the spin echo sequence. We'll look at some numbers to help you uh, make sense of that. Uh, when do we want fast imaging? Well, we always, we kind of always want fast imaging, but there are certainly some specific applications. For a lot of thoracic imaging or abdominal imaging, breathing motion will destroy your image, right? So sometimes we have to do imaging during a breath hold. That means we have to get the imaging done in 15 seconds or maybe 20 seconds, depending on the patient. Um, and, so, and so fast imaging becomes really important there, for example. Uh, Real-time imaging is actually a thing, and so that's not used clinically very much, but increasingly that's sort of an, an option. Uh, it's a little bit, you can think of it a little bit like ultrasound. You point a wand and you sort of immediately get an image back. Well, they're working on that technology for MR where the patient still has to lie in the scanner, but the images are just acquired, reconstructed, and shown to, uh, say, a clinician in real time. They could be stored and reviewed later, of course. The main uh, motivation there is to actually be able to do uh, MR-guided procedures, some of which are done here at UCLA, breast biopsy, uh, uh, biopsies for bone tumors, uh, uh, liver biopsies, ablations, uh, a variety of different things. Um, and then we we'll probably won't spend too much time talking about it, but in MR you can do true three-dimensional imaging. And I don't just mean like a bunch of parallel slices, but there's a, there's a secret to MR where you can actually encode the entire three-dimensional volume and get an entire three-dimensional digital data set of someone's head or knee. Uh, and in those applications, you also need to be able to image uh, very quickly. Uh, gradient echoes are also great because there's flexible image contrast. So I'll, I'll show you today. Uh, we get that image contrast by adjusting things we've seen before, the TE and the TR. Uh, but we also have another degree of freedom, what we call the flip angle. We can control how much we tip the magnetization by. Uh, and that uh, um, relates to our image contrast as well. Um, and when do we want flat, uh, that kind of image contrast? Well, obviously, uh, uh, tissue conspicuity for diagnosis is one of our main goals here. Uh, interestingly, this gradient echo sequence will give us bright blood signals. And there's different ways of uh, sort of understanding this. I'll, sh I'll show you some today. But this is the principle of what we call inflow enhancement. Uh, Typically, we're imaging a particular slice. Maybe it's an axial through the head or the neck or something like this. And when you image an axial, say, through the neck, there's blood that's going through that slice, right? Arterial blood towards the head, venous blood returning. And the fact that that blood flows into the slice that you're imaging leads to so-called inflow enhancement, and blood can be quite bright. Well, you'll see some pictures of sort of how that plays out a little bit later. And that's actually can be a really useful thing uh, for cardiovascular or angiographic applications. Sometimes we want a picture of the vasculature. And under those conditions, the blood is very bright. And that leads to um, kind of uh, some relatively simple ways of viewing uh, the vascular anatomy, for example. Um, the sequence can be relatively low SAR. What was SAR? Do you remember? What's it related to, at least? Heating, yeah. So it's the specific absorption rate. Don't ask me why. I wasn't there when they asked. Um, but it's related to heating of the patient. And a lot of RF pulses lead to a lot of heating. Uh, the gradient echo sequence, however, it uses a lot of RF pulses, but they're low in amplitude. Uh, can be at least low in amplitude. So this, this, this technique can be a low SAR technique, and we don't have to uh, sometimes worry as much, if you will, about uh, patient heating. And that might be really relevant when patients have uh, implanted devices, or uh, if the clinical field moves towards, you know, 7 Tesla imaging, 11 Tesla imaging, turns out SAR is a bigger problem there. Uh, of course, if there's advantages, there's disadvantages. Uh, one of the biggest ones probably is that you have so-called off-resonance sensitivity. Uh, why? Well, this sequence you'll see in a second, there's no refocusing pulse. And the refocusing pulse was the key to the spin echo sequence, and it let you deal with uh, several sources of off-resonance, field and homogeneity, susceptibility, chemical shift, etc. Uh, and we'll see that you also get T2 star weighted images rather than T2. So spin echo is good for T2 weighted images, uh, gradient echo is good for T2 star weighted, and again that's related to the fact that we don't have a refocusing pulse. 
And so spin spin dephasing is not reversible with the with the gradient echo um, acquisition. Uh, one of the downsides to using the gradient echo sequence is you get larger metal artifacts than spin echo. Again, spin echo has that refocusing pulse, so sources of off resonance can be refocused, including uh, uh, things even as severe as the presence of metal, orthopedic implants, and so forth. And so spin echo imaging typically performs better when there's implanted metal uh, in a patient than gradient echo imaging. Uh, a quick comparison of T2 versus T2 star. We saw this uh, in the last lecture. On the left-hand side, we have a bunch of spins, and we're showing T2 decay. Those spins are kind of shrinking in magnitude as the signal decays. And as it swings past our coil, we get a lower and lower and lower amplitude signal. And that's distinct from T2 star decay, where not only do you have T2 losses, those are irreversible, they're just inherent to uh, the, the, the chemical system that you're looking at. Um, you also have losses from off resonance. And when you have sources of off resonance, your spins tend to fan out. They tend to uh, um, uh, precess at slightly different frequencies. And ultimately, if they're pointing in all, every which direction, you really have no detectable signal at that point. And so this is the picture you could have in mind for uh, appreciating the differences between T2 decay and T2 star decay. And this is the one that gradient echo imaging is really sensitive to. Okay, so what's the basic sequence look like? Well, we saw a little bit of, of this before. Uh, we start with an RF excitation pulse. We're taking our spins from their equilibrium position and we're tipping them with some RF energy so they generate some component of transverse magnetization. If we tried to record a signal immediately, we would have what we call the free induction decay. Uh, but it decays really quickly because of T2 decay and also what we call spin dephasing and, and some other things as well. And that signal ends up not being very useful to us. We don't do very much imaging with the, with the so-called free induction decay. And unfortunately, that signal disappears even more quickly when we turn on some gradients. And we haven't really gotten to these, uh, these gradients yet, but all of these gradients that I'm showing you here are important for spatial localization. So again, this is a pulse sequence diagram. It's the timing of how we play RF pulses and gradients to generate an image. Anytime we turn on a gradient, we're introducing a field inhomogeneity. We're making the field less perfect. And so turning on these gradients actually causes that particular signal to decay really quickly. So gradients accelerate what we call spin dephasing. Uh, one of the neat tricks, and it's not entirely obvious, uh, is that gradients can undo gradient-induced, uh, this should say dephasing, as well. And the idea is that if one gradient can cause the spins to dephase, say, one way, then an opposite gradient can pull those spins back together again, at least for a brief period of time. And so this is the, this is the taken all together, this is what the gradient echo sequence looks like. We're basically exciting the spins, we're encoding some spatial information in, in ways that we don't quite understand yet because we haven't covered them. Uh, but the, the trick here really is this frequency encoding gradient on the bottom here can help us form an echo. It's, it's, a really, it's not an intuitive concept. Uh, but the idea is that gradients can, in fact, undo some gradient-induced dephasing and give rise to the formation of a so-called gradient echo. So this is what the, uh, say, maybe composite sequence would look like together. We would uh, excite the spins, and at a later time, we'd form an echo, and that defines our echo time. So exactly how and the timing of these gradients that we use, that will dictate when our echo will form. So we can control our echo time on the scanner. We can pick it, 4 milliseconds, 24 milliseconds. Um, and we can also pick our TR. And our TR is how often we repeat this. Uh, we can repeat the same little block, if you will, every 10 milliseconds, every 100 milliseconds, every second, uh, whatever. Uh, and why and how uh, you choose to do that all relates to imaging speed and uh, image contrast that you want. Uh, so here's uh, at least one pictorial for how this sort of comes together. So uh, let me back this up. So here we have a bunch of spins, five spins that are pointing out at us. They're uh, in their equilibrium position just along the z-axis. And the first thing we're going to do is play the excitation pulse. So the excitation pulse is here, and the spins are going to tip over into the transverse plane. So now all five of those spins are, are say, maybe pointing along the x direction or something. Now remember, there's different sources of off resonance, and every spin sees a slightly different field, so they process and get pushed uh, kind of slightly uh, out of range from one another. But part of what's causing this is actually the applied gradients as well. These gradients themselves 
cause some of that field in homogeneity, and they cause some of the spins, uh, some of the spins um, uh, uh, off resonance uh, behavior. And so when this gradient is negative and then turned positive, um, the positive part of that gradient will actually bring the, the spins back into focus again, and you'll get this little flash or whatever to form the actual echo. And so the idea, again, uh, is the 90 excites things. There may be gradients in addition to other sources of off-resonance that cause things to dephase, but when we turn the gradient from negative to positive, we can rephase some of that off-resonance and actually form an echo. And this, when, they, when all the spins line up again, uh, that's when we get this echo uh, signal forming that we can record. And remarkably, it can store image contrast information as well as spatial uh, information to help us form an, an actual image. Okay, so here's our first, um, our first sort of quiz question. So spin echo versus gradient echo and what we call B0 in homogeneity. So this means that our B0 field's not perfect. Uh, these images, in fact, were acquired with what we call a bad shim. You can remember maybe that we can shim our field. Our fields usually aren't perfect, uh, and when we add a person to the scanner, they're maybe less perfect. We can tune it up. We can shim it to try to make the field uh, a little bit better. Uh, but in this case, we use what we call a bad shim. We can tune it poorly, and this leads to poor B0 homogeneity or lots of off-resonance. And so now I have two images. One of them was a gradient echo image and one of them was a spin echo image. Which one do you think is the spin echo image? Which one do you think is the gradient echo image? Let's, let me ask that in a more direct way. Which image do you think this is? Spin echo or gradient echo? This is the gradient echo image, right? So the gradient echo image is sensitive to sources of off resonance and you'll get these uh, really, you know, can at least get these large signal dropouts. Whereas those same sources of off resonance under the same conditions, because you have a refocusing pulse, the refocusing pulse will deal with that. Uh, those sources of off resonance flip everything over, same sources of off resonance sort of undo each, uh, themselves, and you can get a, a arguably a much better uh, image. Uh, now there's some trade-offs, there's some other trade-offs between spin echo and gradient echo, but spin echo is more insensitive to off resonance. Gradient echo is more sensitive to, uh, to off resonance. Okay, so uh, that's not the whole story, of course, with gradient echoes. Uh, we saw this diagram just a second ago about uh, what defines the TE and what defines the TR. And you'll notice, for example, that uh, there's what we call a lot of dead time in the middle here. So there's time here that might arguably be wasted. If I'm not exciting the spins or encoding the spins or measuring the spins, but in fact I'm not really doing anything, uh, we could argue that's wasted time, and wouldn't we rather uh, move on and collect the next echo uh, so that we could get the exam over with in a shorter period of time? And so here we have to introduce this concept of what we call spoiling. And the idea is that this echo uh, that's forming here, even though I've shown it as decaying, it probably hasn't decayed nearly as much as I'm showing. There's still some 1% or 5% of signal left, and that, that percent of the signal can bleed, so to speak, all the way into the next excitation, and that can lead to image artifacts. Under the ideal circumstances, this echo is, you know, 100% obliterated before we try to do any excitation again. If it's not 100% obliterated, we'll end up with image artifacts. How do we obliterate the echo? Uh, before the next excitation, we use a, a process called spoiling. Uh, so why do we want to use spoiling? Well, it helps us eliminate the transverse magnetization at the end of each TR, and that prevents cumulative errors. It's a little hard to understand, but it prevents errors that would bleed into the next echo and screw up the image contrast or the spatial information that we're trying to um, acquire. Uh, spoiling is helpful because we can use it to shorten the TR, uh, and if we don't, uh, without shortening the TR, the only way to get uh, complete decay of the signal is to wait five time constants or maybe ten time constants. So you have to wait a long time uh, for the signal to completely decay on its own. Uh, spoilers are a way of accelerating the signal decay. And so uh, because we can, sh we can accelerate the signal decay, that ultimately leads to faster imaging. It turns out this also slightly enhances T1 contrast. And so spoiled gradient echo imaging is really good because it's fast and it's really good for T1 weighted imaging. 
that's probably what it's used uh, the most for uh, in a lot of uh, a lot of applications is fast T1 weighted imaging. Uh, I'm going to skip that slide and just show you some examples here. So this comes back to the gradient echo and the spoiling sequence. How do we do it? Well, again, it's not totally obvious. You remember maybe from the FID slide that we said the FID decays here, but it decays even more quickly when we turn on gradients. Well, it's the same case after we formed the gradient echo. If after we formed the gradient echo, we turn on a so-called spoiler gradient, we can accelerate dephasing of the signal and accelerating the dephasing leads to more decay. We, get, we, we basically uh, get rid of the, any residual uh, information. And if the spoiler gradient is effective and it gets rid of uh, the, the transverse magnetization very quickly, maybe it's you know, a millisecond or a couple milliseconds, then there's no longer a need to wait after that spoiler gradient. And so we can tuck these things uh, all together and image more quickly. So the spoiler gradient decays the transverse magnetization very quickly and then we can get rid of any dead time that we might have and pack things together to be more time efficient. So these are just some kind of bells and whistles slides that show, you know, sort of what's the capability here, right? So here's fast T1 weighted imaging that's done in real time. Uh, is this clinically useful? Uh, I think it's an emerging application, but I wouldn't say that it's uh, something that we're using routinely now, sometimes for some thoracic things and some cardiac things, but um, uh, not too much outside of that right now. We use gradient echo imaging all the time, especially for fast T1 weighted imaging. Here I'm just trying to emphasize that uh, the, the you know what the speed limit is here. Okay, so quick quiz. Uh, echoes are needed because the FID disappears too quickly. True or false? FID was that signal right after the 90, right? So true or false? True. The FID disappears really quickly. And so echoes are a way of kind of getting around that a little bit. Gradient echo imaging is less sensitive to off resonance than spin echo imaging. True or false? False. I love it. Uh, gradient echoes use a refocusing, a refocusing pulse to form an echo. False, right? So you could correct that in, in different ways, but you would probably say spin echo uses a refocusing pulse to form an echo. Uh, and then I think it's the last one. So gradient and RF spoiling enable faster imaging. I went over it kind of quickly there. We talked about gradient spoiling in particular. Does gradient spoiling enable faster imaging? Yes, that's what helps us pack that sequence down a little bit and get fast uh, gradient echo imaging. Okay, so a little bit about how those gradient echoes are formed. Probably the key thing to remember is that the spin echo requires a refocusing pulse. The gradient echo uses gradients. It uses gradients to form an echo. Even if conceptually that's not obvious, that's a good thing to remember. Okay, so what about contrast? Well, of course, there's an equation that governs and tells us about contrast. It's a little bit more complicated than the ones that we saw for the spin echo sequence. Uh, and I just want to point to a couple things here. This, again, falls out from those block equations. The block equations always tell us uh, how the spins behave. It's a question of doing a lot of math to get even down to these uh, still complicated equations. What do we see? Wow, that's, that was good. Uh, okay, so what do we see? So the contrast, the image contrast, depends on several tissue properties. You can see it still depends on the, on the proton density. That's always going to be there. It still depends on T1. So we see T1 appearing in two different places. And in this case, it depends on T2 star, right? So previously with the spin echo expression, we saw that it depended on T2 only. Here it depends on T2 star. T2 is spin-spin interaction and signal losses. The star component is the, are these additional sources of alpha resonance that cause signal loss. So those are the tissue properties that it depends on. Um, but it also depends on things that we control. So we don't control the tissue properties, right? Patients show up as they are. But we do control uh, contrast in the image by adjusting the TR. So you see the TR showing up. And TR is always linked to T1. We can also control the TE. TE is always linked to T2. You'll never see like TE and T1 sort of going together. Uh, so TE is linked to T2, and in this case, T2 star. And then the other thing that we control here now is the flip angle. We didn't have this in the spin echo sequence. The spin echo sequence was defined for us. It was a 90 and a 180. And in the simplest case, it's always a 90 and a 180. In the gradient echo sequence, we can control the flip angle. 
The flip angle is the excitation energy, or the excitation flip angle. So when I have spins at equilibrium, I could tip them with a 90, and I'd have a 90 degree flip angle. But there's also reasons that you might only tip them by 10 degrees and let them relax. And the main reason you do that, if you tip by 10 degrees, they get back up more quickly, right? And so that actually helps with fast imaging as well. But changing the flip angle will change our contrast. And I'll give you some insight about that in just a second as well. Uh, so here's T2 star weighted imaging. This is just uh, through the sagittal through the knee. Uh, so T2 star weighted gradient echo imaging. Uh, this is using a so-called flash sequence. Doesn't matter, it's a spoiled gradient echo sequence. And what I'm showing you here is changing just the TE. So from a short TE with a kind of uh, intermediate uh, TR, this would effectively give us uh, a relative kind of proton density weighted image, not a lot of contrast between tissues. And as we increase just the TE, going out to longer and longer TEs, our signal has heavily decayed at that point. And really the, the things that show up the best at the, I don't know how good the window level is on this screen here, but there's some uh, 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 synovial fluid here that shows up relatively bright because synovial fluid in particular has a really long T2. So that signal takes forever to decay. And so its signal, pat uh, signal decay pattern is relatively slow. Uh, and that's in distinction to say subcutaneous fat, which is relatively intermediate uh, uh, decay rates, uh, whereas muscles T2 is actually quite short. Uh, and in fact, I'm showing T2 plots here. Uh, the T2 stars of these tissues would be uh, even shorter. And so again, what's being shown in these images here is taking pictures at different points during the transverse magnetization's uh, decay. Uh, now, here we're only looking at pictures basically acquired at 5 milliseconds after excitation or 50 milliseconds after excitation. So everything is really happening in a window that's, that's really down over here, right? If we waited all the way to you know, 2,500 milliseconds, these signals would be completely gone and you would just barely be able to see uh, CSF, for example. So what's the point? Well, the point is we can adjust the T2 star weighting in our image by adjusting our TE. Uh, and we saw that in the previous expression. We can adjust our TE and that's related to the T2 star signal intensity of different tissues. Sorry for that. Uh, okay, so here's another example. So these are uh, just T2 star weighted gradient echo images through the shoulder. And again, just taken, I thought these were maybe just a little bit better example, uh, with an intermediate TE of about 9 milliseconds. At 9 milliseconds, the signal uh, intensities are, are a little bit uniform. There's not a lot of contrast uh, between tissues. And as that echo time gets to be long, you're sort of developing the magnetization, you're developing the contrast. And here you can see joint fluid uh, has a really long T2, so it stays bright for a very, very long time. Uh, whereas, uh, say, marrow here, which has a pretty short T2 star, uh, that signal is decaying pretty quickly. Uh, and in this case, muscle and fat have relatively similar uh, signal intensities. So again, just by adjusting the echo time, we can draw out the image contrast that we might want. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of numbers? Well, it's good to remember, and in fact, this is really similar to what we saw for the spin echo sequence in, 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 in terms of the language that we use to describe it. If we want a spin density weighted image or a proton density weighted image, we want a short TE and a long TR. A short TE means we don't have T2 star contrast, and a long, uh, a short TE means no T2 star contrast, and a long TR means we don't have T1 contrast, and so you're sort of by default left over with proton density weighted imaging. The one nuance here is that uh, the flip angle that you use plays a strong role in image contrast, and I'll show you some images of that in just a second. So bottom line, the language we use to describe these things, what TE to use, what TR to use, are similar, uh, especially if you compare it to say the uh, spin echo sequence, but the actual numbers we use are different. So here we can see uh, for a spin echo sequence, if I want spin density weighted, I need a short TE and a long TR. Uh, our flip angle is always going to be that 90, 180 pair. Um, what you need to be mindful of though, is that even though we say short, long, and short, long for say the gradient echo and spin echo images, the actual numbers we use can be pretty different. And so uh, I won't sort of belabor the point, but if you just look at spin density weighted imaging, again, we're going to use a short TE 
and a t uh, of like five milliseconds, and that's different than spin density weighted imaging for spin echo, which is 10 or 30 milliseconds. I don't think it's critical that you remember these uh, exact numbers per se, but I think ballparks are, are, are good, right? What kinds of T1s, what kinds of T2s, uh, sorry, what kinds of TEs, what kinds of TRs do I need to get a particular image contrast? Um, if you had a protocol example that said, oh, I'm trying to do you know, T1 weighted imaging with a TE of 20 milliseconds and a TR of you know, two seconds, you should be able to identify that that T TR is far too long to be a T1 weighted sequence, for example. Okay, so here's uh, another head-to-head. -head. So uh, we've got two images, sagittals through the knee again. Uh, and the question is, which image is the gradient echo image? Uh, so we've got an image on the left and we've got the image on the right. Um, and there's several sort of differences that we'll talk about that compare the spin echo and gradient echo image. Uh, who, uh, who thinks the image on the on image A is the gradient echo image? So then who thinks uh, image B is the gradient echo image? So at least some positive responses. Okay, so I won't, I won't sort of call out, but what, so why do you think this looks like more like the gradient echo image and, and, and consequently less likely to be the spin echo image? What features do you pick up on? One, one, one uh, tip or trick is that gradient echo images will oftentimes be a little bit noisier. And so this image on the right-hand side looks a little noisier. The main reason for that is these are fast sequences, and fast sequences will be noisier sequences. So we can, we can always get higher signal to noise, but it's going to take us more time. Uh, so that's one uh, tip. Uh, there's, there's probably a couple others in here as well. well. We'll just cut right to it. One is that you can just, gradient echo images have really short echo times, really short echo times, much shorter than the spin echo sequence in general. And so signals that tend to decay really quickly, uh, in this case from pointy to uh, meniscus and to uh, patellar tendon, these signals are not substantial. Uh, but if you compare it to the spin echo image, the spin echo image has a longer echo time, and those tissues tend to decay and, and disappear and be gone. Uh, another pickup is that the spin echo images tend to look sharper, right? There tends to be just sharper details because the off resonance has been dealt with with that refocusing pulse. So spin echo images oftentimes are preferred uh, in that they are sort of sharp, uh, clean looking images, uh, but they also take a long time to acquire and so they, they can't necessarily be used for all applications. Okay, a couple true falses. So gradient echo sequences have longer TRs than spin echo sequences. False, a short TR sequence. Gradient echo is great for fast T1 weighted imaging. True or false? True, right? That's its, that's its staple. That's what we probably use it the most for. Uh, metal artifacts on gradient echo imaging are typically small. False, right? So metal's a problem generally, but it's worse on gradient echo imaging. Metal on spin echo could be okay, uh, or at least not, not, not such terrible artifacts that it's completely non-diagnostic. Uh, gradient echo is great for T2 contrast. False, right? So it's T2 star, right? That's the key to remember is that it's T2 star contrast for gradient echo imaging. Okay, so I want to revisit this idea of flip angles. We know a little bit about adjusting TE. We know a little bit about adjusting TR. We need short this and long that to get specific image contrast. But what about the flip angle itself? Well, it turns out there's a way to pick your flip angle if what you want to do is maximize the signal intensity. And usually that's a good idea. Usually you want the most signal you can get out of the system. What's interesting, and I think the big take home here is, you don't just want the biggest flip angle the system will let you use, right? It turns out there's an optimum. Really, really low flip angle is not good. Really, really high flip angle is not good. And so that means there's something in the middle. How do you pick that something in the, in the middle? Uh, well, Richard Ernst, uh, got his Nobel Prize for things related to MR, uh, gave us an expression for calculating what we call the Ernst angle. We won't get into the details of where it comes from, but not surprisingly, it comes from the block equations again. And it basically just says, look, if you know the TR that you want to use, right, and the TR is sometimes governed by protocol time. You need your protocol to be a five-minute protocol and not a 55-minute protocol. So you've picked your TR. And then in general, you know some T1s that you care about. Maybe you're doing MSK imaging, maybe you're doing neuroimaging, 
bottom line, if you know your TR and you know your T1, this expression here, even if a little complicated, will tell you what flip angle to use to get the maximum amount of signal. So the Ernst angle gives you the maximum signal for a particular sequence. So what does that look like? Well, it turns out different tissues, whether it's fat or muscle, will have different signal, prof uh, signal intensities as a function of their flip angle. This is what I was saying before. So let's just pay attention to fat for a second. If I use a gradient echo sequence and I use a tiny flip angle of just a few degrees, I won't get very much signal. As I increase my flip angle to 10 degrees and then to 20 degrees, I'll get a lot of signal for just the right flip angle. But as I over tip it, as I use too high of a flip angle, I actually start getting lower and lower and lower signal intensities for fat. And you get a similar but slightly different curve for muscle because muscle has a different T1 than fat's T1. Uh, and then the, the white dashed line is just the contrast, just the difference between these two uh, tissues, between fat and muscle. And so as a, as a clinician, as an operator, you could say, well, I want, the, I want the highest fat signal. And these curves would tell you, well, OK, fine. Then you need to image it. Maybe it's 15 degrees. Uh, or you want the highest muscle signal. And that means you have to choose a different flip angle. Or maybe what you want is the most contrast between fat and muscle, in which case you have to use yet a different flip angle. The point being, the, the real take home here is that the flip angle has to be well chosen, and higher is not better. And so here's some quick images, again, uh, taken through the knee. So we can do imaging with a one degree flip angle. That means we're doing gradient echo imaging, but we're just barely tipping the magnetization over at all, right? If we just barely tip it over at all, we don't even generate transverse magnetization, or not appreciable transverse magnetization. And I just get basically a noisy image. Somewhat remarkably, you really only have to use five degrees, 10 degrees, and maybe look at this. At 20 degrees, you're getting good, uh, what I would say are good looking images. We've got high muscle signal at about 10 degrees. You can see the muscle looks pretty bright. And we've got high fat signal at about 20 degrees. So the subcutaneous fat here looks pretty bright. And then in fact, if we go to 30 degrees, we've maybe got the best contrast between say muscle and adjacent fat. And as we push the, push the imaging sort of higher and higher and higher, we're not necessarily getting uh, better quality images, but we are depositing a lot of energy in our subject. So again, the point is the flip angle should be well chosen. And, and typically, relatively small flip angles of sort of 10 degrees or 20 degrees are going to be close to the, uh, the, the uh, flip angle that you want to use. OK. Uh, gradient echo and spin echo imaging can both provide T2 star contrast. True or false? False. Gradient echo imaging is T2 star. Spin echo is T2 in the, in the simplest case. Uh, gradient echo imaging and spin echo imaging use the same TE and the same TR to produce a T1 weighted image. False. So we still want a short TE and an intermediate TR, but the exact numbers that you use are pretty different between a gradient echo and a spin echo sequence. Uh, spin echo is better for visualizing tissues with a very short T2 because of the refocusing pulses. kind of complicated one. We, we saw this knee image a, a little while ago. Refocusing pulses are great. They help sort of sharpen up images, if you will. Uh, but spin echoes typically have longer TEs. Longer TEs mean more T2 decay. And so we saw the meniscus, for example, and tendon on the spin echo image was gone, right? That signal was basically gone. So gradient echo imaging has shorter TEs, and it's even better uh, for visualizing tissues with a very short T2. So this would be false. Uh, last one, in gradient echo imaging, higher flip angles always produce brighter images. False, right? We have an optimum. There's some kind of middle ground. Not too low, not too high. Somewhere in the middle is going to be the, the best flip angle to use. Uh, and again, I put in some learning objectives here that maybe steer or guide you back to thinking about uh, the stuff I've shown you already. Um, Given uh, time, uh, I'm going to just keep going. Uh, well, let me take a look here. I know a little break is good. Yeah, why don't we take a quick break right now, and then we'll come back and talk about gradient echoes and fat. Uh, but I'll start right at uh, 8.05 or something like that, once you get a coffee or restroom break. Or questions. You can ask questions.
Okay, I know that was a, a relatively short break, but um, I, I have a sort of hard cutoff right at nine for a thesis proposal, so we will uh, not go too long today. Um, so the next topic I want to touch on is gradient echoes and fat. What do we? What do you guys remember about fat? There's something special about fat when it comes to MR. Does it resonate at the same frequency as water? It's close. It's really close. And this underlies the concept of what we call chemical shift. And so most of what we image is, is the protons and water molecules. And most of our body is comprised of water in some form or another, uh, or tissues that are heavily composited by water. Fat has a very has lots of protons, has lots of, lots of hydrogen, rather. Uh, but those hydrogens are bound to a very different chemical environment, usually through CH groups. And that slightly different chemical environment of fat, or even that substantially different chemical environment of fat, means that the protons, the hydrogen in fat, precesses at a slightly different frequency than that of water. And this means that, that uh, because our bodies, if they're not composited of, of water, then they are also composited of fat, uh, there are different imaging characteristics for water and fat, in part because of this so-called chemical shift. The fact that fat has a slightly different frequency uh, from water. Uh, and so there's different chemical shift artifacts that we can talk about. One of them is chemical shift artifact type 1, and that's in distinction to what people call type 2. So in the next 10 slides or so, we'll, we'll go through both. And the idea is that fat and water have different Larmor frequencies, but it depends on the field strength. It's a, it's a percent difference. So it's a percent difference based on field strength, 1.5 T, 3 T. And it's about 220 hertz at 1.5 T, and it's twice that at 3 T. So obviously it would be twice that at 6 T, whatever. Uh, 
And the bottom line is they resonate or process at slightly different frequencies. But one of the tricks in MR is that spatial position is related to spin frequency. Not, a, not an obvious concept. You saw it a little bit before where when we want to uh, excite a slice, we can turn on a gradient and we can get spins to process at different frequencies. And then if I tune an RF pulse to this slice, I can excite this slice or I can change the frequency slightly and, and excite a slice closer to my head or closer to my feet. So we sort of understand that spatial position is related to spin frequency. And in this case, because fat uh, inherently processes at a slightly different frequency, it can be misinterpreted as appearing or occurring at a different location. Now this is a severe example shown on the right-hand side here. Uh, this is an axial through the, uh, through the thigh. Uh, and what you'll see here is on the left-hand side is mostly water and muscle and the different muscle groups surrounding the bone. Uh, but that subcutaneous fat, which is shown as this ring on the right-hand side here, is spatially misregistered, you know, hugely. You won't typically see the effect this exaggerated, but this is a nice example of sort of what's happening. And it happens again because spatial position is related to spin frequency and the frequency of fat is always different than water, and we can't tell that it's the signal's coming from fat or water, right? That's what the imaging experiment is supposed to help us understand. And so we just measure frequencies in MR, and we interpret those as positions, and we misinterpret fat's uh, signal as coming from a different location. Uh, and, and because of these frequency differences, and because the frequency difference is larger for 3T, then fat is going to be more spatially misregistered uh, in 3T imaging than it will be for 1.5T imaging. I showed this information before when we first talked about chemical shift. I won't dig into it again, but it's basically just saying that uh, the, the hydrogen uh, that's tied to things like CHT, CH2 groups is shifted by about 3.5 parts per million. Think of that as like a percent, but parts per million. And this is what gives rise to the fact that the shift for fat could be about 220 hertz, uh, as one example. And so, uh, oops, this isn't quite working the way it's supposed to. Uh, so picture that all of these <laughs> are processing at the same frequency. It's going to go in sequence for some reason. They're supposed to all be processing at the same frequency. And the point is that water spins in a uniform field just process at the Larmor frequency. And so we haven't turned on a gradient. When we do something a little bit more interesting, sorry, it's gonna tick through this one too. Where did I move? So here, now we turn on a gradient, and when we turn on a gradient, we can control the spin frequency. I have a positive gradient applied here, and the result is that these spins process more quickly than its neighboring spins, who maybe see an opposing gradient. And so this is my B0 field magnitude, and when I turn on a gradient, in this case an X gradient, the field that I see depends on how far away I am from the middle of the scanner. And as I get farther and farther away from the middle of the scanner, I see a stronger and stronger field. And the consequence is that these spins will, will be processing quickly, whereas spins at the other end may actually be processing more slowly. This gradient here actually slightly opposes the B0 field and pushes the Larmor frequency down a little bit. So water spins process at different Larmor frequencies, especially when there's a non-uniform B0 field. In this case, we make it non-uniform by applying a gradient. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, water and fat spins in a gradient field will do something like this, where what we notice is that this water spin here and this fat spin here are processing at the same frequency. Why? Well, there's a gradient applied at this spatial location, so this spin should be going a little bit faster, but because it's fat that's located there, fat processes inherently a little bit more slowly. And so the combination of the applied gradient and the fact that it's fat means it actually processes almost identically or even identically to its neighbor. And so this is going to create a problem for us because we interpret frequencies as telling us about spatial position information. So what kind of problem does that create? Well, in principle, it creates signal overlap because we interpret this fat as having a frequency associated with this position, but we also have underlying water with the same frequency, which we interpret to be as from that position. And then interestingly, when we measure frequencies, we don't measure anything at this particular frequency or very little at this particular frequency. 
And so that means we get a void in that particular location. There's no, there's no signal with that particular frequency. There must not be any tissue at that particular spatial position. So we, the consequence is that fat will chemically shift in the spatial sense it will shift and it will give us a signal overlap as well as signal voids uh, because the fat is moved away from its uh, inherent position. Um, interestingly, one sort of one thing that helps with this is changing what we call the bandwidth. This is one of the more obscure or sort of complicated parameters to understand on the, on the MR scanner. We can control what we call the bandwidth by increasing the bandwidth, we actually increase the, uh, the strength of the applied gradient. So here I'm calling it twice as high. That means uh, when you have a gradient that's twice as strong, the spins will process at twice the, uh, let's see if we go back, sorry. If we go back here, these spins are processing more quickly. This is even more, this is even faster than it was before because this gradient is turned on even more strongly. The advantage of turning on a stronger gradient, the advantage of using higher bandwidth, is that this chemical shift is still kind of 220 hertz, and that ends up being a smaller percentage of all of the frequencies. And so with high bandwidth, we get less signal overlap, and we get a smaller signal voids. And we'll see this in an imaging example in just a second. Um, if I go back to uh, just this image again, though, you'll notice um, that you very clearly can see where we get signal overlaps, right? We have fat misrepresenting its location, overlapping with water signal, and then we also have voids, right? There's basically no signal reporting from just immediately adjacent to uh, the muscle signal. So this is that concept of chemical shift of uh, type 1. Let's go down to here. So this is sort of a summary slide about, whoops, a summary slide about that. So here we have what we call a low bandwidth image. It's a, it's a parameter that we can adjust on the scanner, and we have a high bandwidth image on the right-hand side. And there's a few differences that you'll notice between those uh, images. On the left-hand side here, we get a little bit of pile-up. We have a little bit of fat piling up on top of water signal, so it's overrepresented, um, And we have a little bit of a signal shift away, so we have a little bit of a void. Whereas in the high bandwidth scan, you have less of that problem fat is more faithfully represented as it's in its true location. Um, and there's a uh, pointing more, more distinctly to some of the voids that open up and develop. The other thing you'll notice though, and this is uh, another consequence of using a higher bandwidth scan, high bandwidth means scanning fast, and scanning fast means noisy. And so you'll notice that this high bandwidth image is noisier if you just look at sort of how speckled uh, the muscle is or how speckled the outer uh, air signal is, and so high bandwidth signals tend to be noisy. So what's the, what are the pluses and minuses of high bandwidth? Well, you get less chemical shift, so that's good, uh, potentially, uh, but you have lower signal to noise, so that could work against you a little bit. Uh, but high bandwidth also, I said, means scanning quickly, uh, and so we can have shorter TEs and shorter TRs with a higher bandwidth scan. And then it's sort of the opposites are true for low bandwidth. You get more chemical shift, so that may be a problem. Uh, but you will get higher signal to noise, and that's a benefit. Uh, but you'll have a slightly longer TE and TR, and that uh, will affect your, say, protocol uh, time, for example. There's another sort of consequence of fat. So not just the spatial misregistration component, but something else as well. And it turns out that pixels, right, little volumes that we're interrogating or imaging, they're frequently going to be a mixture of fat and water, right? Nothing is, oftentimes we'll be running on boundaries of tissues or, or there may be um, uh, an underlying disease process that leads to the development of fat in, in particular tissues. The pixel intensity that we measure or see in an MR image, though, is the vector sum. It's the addition of both the fat signal and the water signal. But you have to remember these are, these are little vectors, right? These are water signal and fat signals are spinning around um, at, at, at their respective frequencies. And so let's picture this as, as a pixel that we care about, right? And we've got some fat in that pixel and we've got some water in that pixel. Maybe this is something that's just right on the boundary of subcutaneous fat and muscle or maybe it's something more, uh, more interesting. At this particular point in time, my fat uh, uh, magnetic signal and my water magnetic si signal are pointed in the same direction. And if they process around for a certain amount of time, we know that they're at slightly different processional frequencies, right? We know, oops, sorry, 
we know that fat and water process at slightly different frequencies. And so if we let them process after we've excited them for a certain amount of time, there will be time points where they're perfectly in alignment again, right? Fat will have gone around six times and water will have gone around seven times. They'll, ca they'll catch up with one another. And that's really neat because at that point in time, we refer to fat and water as being in phase. Uh, and if they're in phase, then the addition of two in phase vectors is going to be greater than zero. They're both sweeping past my coil at the same time. They're adding their signals to each other as they sweep past my coil and induce a, a signal that I can measure. That's in distinction to being so-called out of phase. So if we let them process for even longer, but try to capture an image at this point in time, now I have fat and water out of phase with one another. They're going to be uh, coming in and out of phase at different points in time, and I can time my imaging experiment so that they're in phase or that they're out of phase, and I'll get very different image appearance in doing so. So when they're opposed phase, and they're, uh, say, equal in magnitude, then when I add, um, say, my water vector to my fat vector, then their sum is going to be something like zero. And zero means no signal. So out of phase, uh, when the signals are out of phase with one another, I'll get a signal dropout. I'll get very little signal from those. Uh, interestingly, the TE is what controls the phase between fat and water. So water has a larmer frequency. Fat has a slightly different frequency. The echo time is how long I wait before I make my actual measurement, and how long I wait controls whether these things will be in phase or out of phase with one another. And so here's two uh, gradient echo images that are so-called in phase image on the left and the opposed or out of phase image on the right. And what you'll notice on the left hand side is that the boundaries between, you know, the distinct boundaries say between subcutaneous fat and muscle, they tend to be relatively smooth sort of um, not especially distinct boundaries in some ways. Whereas if you look at the opposed phase image on the right hand side, uh, you'll see these really dark lines in between adjacent fat and water. And that means that in this particular location right there, say, when I formed my echo, fat and water were out of phase or opposed phase with one another, and their two signals canceled each other. Uh, and that's because I chose an echo time such that they would come very close to canceling one another. If, on the other hand, uh, I choose an echo time such that those two signals are in phase with one another, then those signals will add up and I'll, and I'll, get, no, I'll, I'll get sort of a normal appearing uh, signal at that particular location. Uh, so again, we can see these sort of voids uh, or lack of voids uh, in the in phase, lack of voids in the in phase image and the appearance of voids in the opposed phase image. Okay, so then a, a quick quiz. So we've got two images here on the left hand side is a gradient echo image, on the right hand side is a gradient echo image. One is the in phase image and one is the opposed phased image. Do you think A is in phase or opposed phase? In phase, right? And then, uh, and why? Well, you don't see these sort of distinct boundaries between, say, fat and water. You see just sort of normal anatomic boundaries, if you will. On the right-hand side, however, you start picking up these really dark interfaces in between fat and water. And this, if I didn't say it before, this is chemical shift type 2 uh, error. And there's actually some, some neat things you can do with this. It can help you see sort of distinguished uh, uh, it can help you a little bit to distinguishing whether something is sort of a fatty infiltration or a fatty tumor or something like that. Um, there's actually a whole host of techniques that we can use to actually generate water images separately from fat images. And we call that usually fat water imaging or even Dixon imaging, uh, named after a guy named Tom Dixon. Uh, and that's actually a, a really useful, uh, or can be a very useful clinical technique where you can actually generate an image of just the water and generate a different image of just the fat. And that's a trick of playing with your echo times and then uh, doing some things in the reconstruction. We won't have time to talk about it uh, in detail today. Okay, so a few more topics about gradient echoes and flow, uh, or gradient echoes in general. We talked about this briefly before. This is about flow uh, and the, the principle of so-called inflow enhancement. So Every time you, anytime you play an RF pulse, you, you slightly saturate the tissue. And picture that I'm imaging an axial through my head, and I'm hitting it with RF pulses, and I have to hit it with hundreds of RF pulses to build an image. Tissues in that slice, their signal actually gets a little bit saturated because you keep trying to use it, and it just doesn't get to completely recover uh, in between RF pulses. And so we get partial saturation of stationary tissues, tissues that lie in the slice of interest. And that's really true because the TR is typically a lot shorter than the T1. 
the, the, the magnetization doesn't get to fully recover in between each TR. Uh, inflow, however, uh, is the inflow of generally fully relaxed spins. So again, if you picture a slice through my neck, I've got arterial flow going up, venous flow coming down, and I'm imaging this axial slice, the blood's going sort of into this slice from you know, the superior side to the inferior side sort of constantly, right? There's new blood flowing into that slice. Whereas the muscle and the fat tissue and the nervous tissues, those are stationary in the slice. And those inflowing spins are fully relaxed, right? They've never seen an MR, uh, an MR RF pulse. They were coming from my heart or returning from my brain and they're brand new and fresh and they've got fully recovered Z magnetization. Uh, so those, those inflowing spins effectively haven't seen an RF pulse. And as a consequence, they have a lot of magnetization to give you uh, to your signal. And so in combination, this sort of partial saturation of things that are stationary and the inflow of things that are totally relaxed, that combination gives you really high contrast. And that's the principle that underlies what we call time of flight imaging. Uh, so the left-hand side here is just an angiogram uh, using, some, using a MIP, a maximum intensity project, projection as well. But we're imaging you know, a, a slab or a chunk of the brain to help us identify uh, the, the vasculature for that particular uh, subject. And it's largely based on the fact that uh, of this inflow enhancement of bright blood flowing into uh, a signal. Uh, so let me show you a little bit about the saturation effect and, and the inflow effect together. So anytime we do imaging, we have to use lots of RF pulses, typically hundreds of RF pulses. Remember, an echo just gives us one line of image information, and we probably need hundreds of lines of image information to actually build a, a good quality image that's 256 pixels by 256 pixels. Uh, if you use a single RF pulse, the first RF pulse will actually give you quite a bit of signal, but the second RF pulse and the third and the fourth and the tenth and the fiftieth and the hundredth RF pulse will give you less and less signal because you didn't get a chance to completely recover your magnetization. It didn't get all the way back up to its equilibrium uh, position again. And so as a consequence, you're driving down from the maximum possible signal that you could get to some what we call steady state value. Eventually, if you keep hitting the spins with the same RF pulse, they reach some saturated steady state value. And this is typical of almost all the imaging that we do. And so we can see, you know, that the fat signal sort of dies off, but it's still relatively bright because of its relatively short T1. Uh, and the muscle signal also decays as we play more and more RF pulses, but it reaches a steady state, but it's lower steady state because it has an even longer uh, T1. The interesting thing, though, is that blood is really, really bright in this particular image, right? So this is an uh, we do a lot of cardiac imaging. This is the blood and the RV that I'm pointing to specifically and then the LV adjacent to it. And you can see that the blood signal is really, really bright, but blood has a really long T1. So based on this diagram, it should be a pretty dark signal, darker even than muscle, but because it's flowing in new, uh, it never sees more than a few RF pulses. Uh, another way to understand it is as follows. So here um, we have just say a, 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 you know, the anatomy of interest with an artery flowing through it. And RF pulses are used to excite a very particular slice. Uh, the inflowing spins, in this case blood or arterial blood, are exposed to fewer RF pulses and they consequently appear bright. Uh, whereas tissues are exposed to many, many RF pulses then they get saturated or they ultimately get darker. Uh, Sorry, I don't know if that's playing quite like that. So there's some interesting tricks with this just to kind of drive the point home. Uh, maybe this is the imaging volume that we're interested in here. And of course, we have arteries going in one direction, veins typically going in the opposite direction in terms of the direction of flow. And we can use what we call a saturation band. I can actually saturate blood, tip it down with a 90 degree pulse and sort of destroy the signal so I get rid of it. And depending on where I place my saturation band, I can get different image contrasts in my imaging volume. In this case, uh, if I play a saturation band down here, it'll hit the arterial blood, but the arterial blood's going away from my slice, so I don't really care. Uh, but it will also hit my venous blood, and my venous blood is flowing into my volume, but because it's been saturated, the venous blood will look really dark, and the arterial blood will look bright because of that so-called inflow enhancement. So we can play with these saturation bands to exaggerate arterial flow. So we get an arterial angiogram using time of flight, or we could get a venogram 
by placing the saturation band in a, in a different place. Uh, so here's uh, the sort of opposite example of that, uh, where, I've, where I've switched around the location of the saturation, plan, saturation band relative to the imaging volume, and now I'm nominally saturating the arterial blood so it's dark when it gets into my imaging slice, but the venous blood, because it's flowing the other way, it sees the saturation band, but it just keeps flowing away, and it doesn't really enter into the imaging slice itself. So on a practical level, it looks something like this. So Here's no saturation band. This is an axial through the, through the neck or, or close to the neck. Uh, this is a, an axial image where there's no saturation band. You can see that these different vessels appear relatively bright, uh, whether it's an artery or a vein. Uh, here I play an arterial saturation pulse. I'm saturating arterial blood, and you can see that this artery here, the signal drops out, and I'm left primarily with bright inflow enhancement from veins only. I can switch the location of that saturation uh, band so that I can saturate the venous blood. And now I have bright arterial signals, but very dark venous signals. And I don't know that you'd actually want to do this, but you could play uh, both a saturation band above and below your slice, and then actually null both the arterial blood and the venous blood. So the point is here, the big point here is really our ability to uh, uh, manipulate sort of image contrast based on flow and the fact that you should recognize that spins that flow into a slice can be quite bright and give us uh, really nice, uh, for example, angiographic information. Uh, okay, so a couple uh, quick true falses. Fat and water process at frequencies that are more than 1,000 hertz different. False. It's small, right? It's only a couple hundred hertz. 200 hertz, 220 hertz at 1.5 T, 400, 440 hertz at 3 T. Uh, but it's enough to cause us a headache, even though things are processing at 64 megahertz. Uh, fat and water are always out of phase. False, right? We saw that we could create in-phase or opposed-phased images. What was the imaging parameter that controlled whether you were sort of in-phase or out-of-phase? TE, right? Uh, but you also have to remember that uh, that it relates to the actual off-resonance frequency, and the off-resonance frequency is different at 1.5T and 3T. So the TE you need for opposed phase imaging is different at 1.5T and 3T. Uh, fat and water destructively interfere when they are in phase. So we've got fat and water in phase. They're going to add together, so not destructively. So that's false. They constructively interfere. Uh, and then lastly, inflowing spins are bright because they see hundreds of excitation pulses. False, right? Inflowing spins are bright, that's correct, but they're bright because they only see a few RF pulses, right? Our stationary tissues are the ones that see hundreds of RF pulses, and their signal gets driven down a little bit, and then blood comes in fresh and bright. Question. Yes? Yes. Is that something that you would select in like gray plasma resurrection or something like that? Like the larger the area, the less space is going to be saturated in the flow of the image? Um, so uh, there's a graphical user interface, and you will pick the slice that you want to image or the set of slices that you want to image. You can also lay down a saturation band, and that could be parallel to your slice, or it could be not. So you can you can you can pick this slice, then I can put a saturation band sort of anywhere that I want to relative to that slice. And that can be useful for different purposes. Sometimes you want to saturate some other tissue because it's giving you artifacts or something like this. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we've got about 20 more minutes, and all I'll do in, in that time is kind of warm you up uh, to some concepts about spatial localization. And, and we we may not get to case space today. That's fine. We've still got. Uh, some more time to do that. Uh, the key is spatial location, spatial encoding rather in MR is really complicated. Uh, if, if everything I've, I've said already isn't complicated enough, spatial encoding is probably one of the least intuitive concepts in MR. But there's some key things that you, that you need to remember about it. Amongst those are that it really occurs in three steps, three, three key steps. The first thing is slice selection. And these steps happen in order. We have to do these in this order or we're not forming an MR image. The key, uh, the first one is slice selection. You have to pick a slice, right? User is going to pick the slice they want to image, 
and the imaging system is going to adjust the gradients and the RF pulse to excite that particular slice, an axial slice, a coronal slice, sagittal, it doesn't matter, obliques, double obliques. Next, once you've excited that slice, you have to do so-called phase encoding. You have to encode one of the two dimensions within the slice. The slice is two-dimensional sort of thing, right? It has an, nominally has like an X and a Y direction, and phase encoding helps us encode one dimension of that information. The other direction is encoded so through encoded through so-called frequency encoding, or sometimes called the readout. Uh, and necessarily, you have to encode the other dimension within the slice. Uh, Again, it's, it's not obvious, but these phase and frequency encoding steps help you encode the spatial information within the slice, right? Slice selection, the first thing you do says, I want this slice, I want this coronal slice, I want this axial slice. That's the, the first step, if you will. And these last two steps, phase encoding and frequency encoding, they're required to acquire so-called case-based data. We talked about this only briefly at the, at the beginning this morning. Case space is the raw data collected by the scanner, right? It's the, it's, it's the echo data that we collect. And then there's a whole process whereby we interpret the echo information to actually form an image, most of which uh, relies on what we call a Fourier transform. So let's look at this. And this is, this is uh, sort of mind-boggling and baffling, and, and, and yet it works all at the same time. So on the right-hand side here, I have an image image of the mostly of the left ventricle uh, and you can see obviously that it's changing in, in synchronicity with the cardiac cycle so this is typical of cardiac imaging these days the image or rather the information that's actually collected by the scanner is what we show on the left hand side here this is so-called case space and the connection between case space and image space is through what we call a Fourier transform or sometimes a fast Fourier transform the left-hand side information, again, is the data that the scanner actually collects. It's related to the signals that are induced in our coils. It is, uh, right now, showing you what the echoes look like. Um, necessarily, an echo fills a line of case space. Um, and I need to fill all of my lines of case space from top to bottom, say, to have all of the case space I need, such that when I take a Fourier transform, I actually recover an image of the object that I'm interested in, in seeing. So case space is the raw data collected by the scanner. And a particular point in case space, you can see that there's some really unusual, subtle changes in my case space data here that result in rather dramatic changes in my actual images on the right-hand side here. What we'll learn when we talk a little bit more about case space is what an individual point in case space represents. There's a bunch of pixels in here. And in fact, if there's 256 by 256 uh, case space pixels, then I can only make an image that's also 256 by 256. So there's this one-to-one -one correspondence between how much data I acquire and how rich of an image I can form. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that a point in case space, just one particular, say, pixel in case space, represents the presence or absence of what we call a particular spatial frequency. And so you're going to hear this term several times in the context of case space, so-called spatial frequencies. And we'll, we'll touch on this uh, perhaps at the end of today or first thing next uh, lecture. When we look at pulse sequences, and uh, we try not to look at too many of these, this is how it all sort of comes together. And this looks a lot like the gradient echo sequence. The first process is slice selection. We play an RF pulse in combination with a gradient. And that lets us excite a particular slice, you know, a slice that's superior in my head or inferior way down by my ankles. And then once I've excited the slice, in succession I have to do so-called phase encoding and frequency encoding such that I'm encoding spatial information in my echo and then I record my echo in my coil through Faraday's law of induction. So spatial localization critically requires those three steps in that particular order. Slice selection, phase encoding, frequency encoding. Um, the RF pulse, we've, we've talked about this some already, but the RF pulse is tuned to the frequencies of the slice of interest. When I turn on a gradient, I can make spins at my head go really fast and maybe spins at my waist go more slowly. Now I pick an RF pulse that has a frequency match to the slice that I want to excite an image. So the RF pulse is tuned to that particular slice, 
and the gradient that you turn on creates a range of fre frequencies that helps you distinguish slices so that we can separate out exciting one slice relative to exciting some other slice. And then the last little part is this rephasing gradient here. And I won't say too much about it today, but bottom line is it helps increase your signal to noise ratio. It helps refocus some of your signal. It's not clear that it would do that maybe uh, intuitively, but that's its functional purpose. So uh, we saw a diagram like this earlier. We can turn on different gradients. In this case, the green lines are representing the Z gradient and the uh, red lines on the left and right are representing the X gradient. If I turn both of those gradients on simultaneously, uh, then I can create fields that oppose my B0 field and cause spins, or, or the, the magnetic field here is low, and so the Larmor frequency is going to be low. But those same gradients, because they affect, sorry, because they uh, uh, linearly change the magnetic field, I can, I can tune the magnetic field to be very high, say in the top right corner. The combination of turning on different gradients creates a diff different planes of spin isochromats. Isochromat just means spins at the same time or the same frequency. And so these three spins in particular have the same magnetic field. They have the same um, uh, magnetic field exposure. And if they have the same magnetic field uh, and of course they have the same gyromagnetic ratio, then they're going to have the same frequency according to the Larmor relationship. So now if I pick an RF pulse that matches this Larmor frequency, then I'll be exciting these spins and consequently be exciting this oblique slice through my uh, subject. If I change the frequency of my RF pulse slightly, I can make it slightly higher in frequency. I might excite these spins here and I would get a parallel slice that was more sort of uh, inferior to the left uh, in the patient. So RF pulses have to be tuned to the slice of interest and gradients are what help us select which slice we'll actually be imaging, the, the combination together. This is just another example uh, sort of shown in cross-section, sort of an axial, where here's a spin isochromat by turning on an X and a Y gradient and that will help me excite some oblique slice uh, through my patient through my subject. Okay. So there's, there was three steps here. Well, well I can back up here. Uh, so we, we understand something about slice selection, and the next step was phase encoding. Phase encoding consists of the so-called phase encoding gradient. And importantly, that phase encoding gradient's magnitude changes with every TR. Every time we repeat, every time we acquire another echo, the one thing that we've changed is the phase encoding gradient. And the phase encoding gradient helps move us through k-space. It's not obvious, but that's what it does. It helps us get the top line of k-space, and then the next line of k-space, the middle line, and then finally the last line of k-space. And that phase encoding gradient changes with every TR. It has to happen after excitation. You have to have excited the system after all. But it also has to happen before you do the readout, before you try to acquire the signal, because you're trying to encode information into the echo. So it happens right in the middle. Uh, a little more obtuse here, but what it does is add a linear variation uh, of the phase to the signal. Um, there are two different kinds of imaging that we can do in MR, well, there's many, but I'll, we'll talk about these two. We can do so-called 2D imaging, which is just a conventional slice, but it's also possible to do true three-dimensional imaging. The distinction is whether or not you're doing phase encoding in a single direction or dimension, or whether you're doing it in two directions or two dimensions. I won't say a lot about 3D imaging. It does uh, contribute high signal to noise, so it can be very good for certain applications that need high signal to noise, but it also usually comes with long scan times, and so that's a, a clear penalty uh, there. Probably the most important thing to remember is that there's only one phase encode step per echo. And if you look at the phase encoding gradient, typically it's shown as having some very sort of different steps, sort of a high step, an intermediate step, low, low, and lower step, and it's changing with every TR. Uh, we'll pull this all together in just a second. So the last and sort of final step for, for spatial encoding is what we call uh, frequency encoding, or the readout. And that consists of several things. Uh, importantly, it's a frequency encoding gradient is going to be constant for each TR. It's only the phase encoding gradient that's really changing with each TR. And we can't do anything else at that same time. There's no other simultaneous RF pulses. We play gradients and RF pulses at the same time when we want to excite the system. The frequency encoding gradient is when we're really listening and we're just trying to record the echo. So no other RF, no other gradients. 
Uh, and there is this small, again, pre-phasing gradient, this little tiny gradient down here, which helps us form our echo. Uh, that's, a, that's all I'll really sell, uh, say about that. So frequency encoding is encoding the second dimension of space, and it's also critical for helping us to form the actual echo that we record with our system. So this is sort of pulling it all together, uh, at least uh, conceptually. So here's a, uh, arguably a simple uh, pulse sequence. We start again with an RF pulse and a gradient so we can excite the slice that we care about. And then we, do th we can do three things simultaneously. The slice select, this is called the refocusing gradient. It boosts our signal to noise a little bit. And then these two gradients here actually move us around K-space. It's not obvious that that's what they do. You have to do a lot of math to really conceptually appreciate that. But these two gradients will move us through K-space. And, uh, and the last gradient here, the frequency encoding gradient, is what we'll use to actually acquire the echo. What I'm showing you here on the right-hand side is how this sort of comes together. And the point is that these two dashed gradients here will in fact move you out to a point in K-space, and this solid gradient here will let you acquire an echo or simply a line of K-space data, okay? Now what's interesting uh, here, and conceptually you should understand, is that we change the phase encoding gradient with every TR, right? We're gonna need hundreds of TRs to build an image. And by changing this phase encoding gradient, we're able to move through K-space and acquire, say, this bottom line, and then maybe this intermediate line, and then this middle line, and then finally, say, the last two lines. So it's simply this phase encoding gradient's magnitude that dictates which line of K-space we're going to acquire. We have to acquire all of the lines of K-space such that we can then do a Fourier transform and then get our image. The frequency encoding gradient looks the same for every TR, and the slice select business looks the same for every TR. So it's really just this phase encoding gradient that's moving us around to capture different lines of K-space. So what does this all tell us? Well, we know we have to acquire many, many lines of K-space. Like I said, we need 128 lines in our image, then we need to get 128 echoes, or 128 lines of K-space. Uh, and every time we acquire a line, it takes an amount of time that we call the TR, the repetition time. So this starts to give you a little bit of insight as to why MR imaging is slow, unfortunately. So let's look at some, some numbers a little bit. So we can talk about our scan time. And our scan time is dictated by our TR. We choose our TR for a particular protocol, spin echo or gradient echo, T1 weighted, T2 weighted. And we also choose uh, here, the, this, this would be the number of phase encode steps, right? How rich of an image do you want to form? Do you want a low resolution kind of blurry image or do you need for a particular diagnosis a high resolution imaging, uh, high resolution image? We always kind of want high resolution images, but there's a penalty. And one of them is that more and more phase encoding means more and more scan time. Uh, and another thing that we, can, uh, that we can add on here is what we call averages. So for some protocols, you might get all of your lines of case space, but your image quality is still poor. And so you might repeat everything again, and we call that an average. And we might get two averages or four averages. But every time we repeat the experiment, we're obviously increasing our total scan time. So look, let's look at some numbers. We could easily have a TR for a sequence be about 1,000 milliseconds. Um, if it's 1,000 milliseconds, do you think that's a gradient echo sequence or a spin echo sequence? Gradient echoes are pretty short, right? So kind of 10, maybe 100 milliseconds. I heard it uh, from a couple of you. Spin echo sequences tend to have long TRs. So this looks like it's probably a spin echo sequence, long TR. Maybe I want an image that has 256 lines in it. So the, the image that you're going to review has 256 lines, and it's probably 256 lines by 256 points. The points are part of the readout. And then if I don't do any averaging, right, I just say eh, it should be good enough. Well, unfortunately, that means just getting the image information for that one slice is going to take me four minutes, right? So MR imaging, we think it's, we think it's kind of fast, or you, you might, you know, if you look at these things as being all milliseconds and everything's in milliseconds and megahertz and it's quick, uh, when you add it all up, unfortunately, it, it can be rather slow. Uh, and so the, one of the assumptions here is we're only getting one echo per TR, and that's typically true. We excite. We form an echo, and then we wait some time, and we excite, 
and form another echo. And so this is just one example of sort of showing you how MR scanning time can be slow and helping you understand how the scan time is, is calculated. It's related to your TR and it's related to your number of phase encoding steps that you have to uh, acquire. And so obviously we're always interested in, in having the, sh the shortest TRs that give us the contrast we want and not get any, any more phase encodes than we need to, right? The fewer the better. So if a lower resolution image will, is acceptable diagnostically, that's typically going to be a faster scan for your, for your patients. Okay, a little true-false. Uh, slice selection only requires the use of an, of, of an RF pulse. False, it's an RF pulse and the gradient, right? Those two things together. Phase and frequency encoding map out the image information within a slice. True or false? True, right? So slice selection kind of picks the slice for us, and then this kind of unusual concept of phase and frequency encoding is what lets us acquire information within that slice, the sort of two-dimensional pixel information. Uh, slice select, frequency encode, then phase encode. False, right? So I heard, saw a couple nods. Slice select, then phase encode, then frequency encode. Uh, uh, gradient echo TRs are about 10 milliseconds, therefore MRI kind of trailed off there, didn't it? <laughs> Scanning is very fast. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, true or false? <laughs> yeah. So the, it's you know the TRs can be really short, and so that's that's great. And you might think, oh gosh, something's happening in just a few milliseconds. This must all be pretty quick. But I think it's fair to say, as much as I'm a, a, a devotee of MR, that it's uh, that it's it's not really as it, it can be very fast, but it's not always very fast. Okay. Um, let me see where I am here. I know I won't get through all this. That's fine. Let me, let me, let me, let's go through this because I, I think a little repetition helps. And I'll show you a couple slides about case space and then, and then we'll call it a morning. Um, so what is case space? Well, you heard me say it several times, several times. Case space is the raw data collected by the scanner. We form these echoes. The echoes store spatial information and contrast information. And we record the echo to our computer and it helps us form uh, ultimately form the image. A point in K-space, and I'll show you a nice movie of this and we'll probably wrap up at that point, but a point in K-space tells us about the presence or absence of what we call a spatial frequency or a pattern in the acquired image. Not an obvious concept, but I'll show you something in just a second that hopefully makes it more clear. Each echo that we acquire measures many of the spatial frequencies that comprise an object. And this term spatial frequency is going to keep coming up, and I want to, I want to give you a little bit of uh, insight to that, uh, the, the last thing here. K-space does have units. It's, you can, we keep referring to it as a spatial frequency. Usually you think of like audio frequencies, and they're hertz, they're cycles per second. These are K-space, or spatial frequencies, and they have units of one over distance, one over centimeters, one over millimeters, and you can think of that as being uh, sort of analogous to an audio signal. The gradients that we keep using and talking about, they help us extract spatial frequency information. And they help, you saw how the phase encoding gradient, for example, moves us around in K-space. And hopefully we remember that a line of K-space is filled by a single echo. We have to generate hundreds of echoes to fill K-space and, 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 and produce a, a useful image. And then lastly, uh, by taking the 2D Fourier transform of our K-space data, that helps produce the image. So the mathematical operator here you really want to remember is the Fourier transform. Whether or not you know the mathematics behind that or not is not critical right now. So this is the last thing I'll show you uh, this morning. Uh, is it this one? No. Oh, uh, shoot. Uh, this one. Okay. So we saw something similar to this before, uh, but this is slightly different. So on the left-hand side is the case space information, and it's changing over time, just as our cardiac image on the right-hand side is changing over time. The difference this time is you'll notice this little white spike that's drifting around. That white spike is basically telling me how intense a particular spatial frequency pattern is. Uh, obviously, in the middle here, the spatial frequencies are generally relatively intense, and as you get out to the edges of K-space, they're less intense. 
Here I've manipulated my case space data so that this particular point as it moves through time is heavily overrepresented. And the consequence is what you see on the right hand side. Underneath, almost all of those spatial frequencies contribute somewhat remarkably to forming a useful cardiac image. But by simply overrepresenting this one particular spatial frequency at a particular point in time, I get these really strange banding patterns across the image. Okay? Every point in K space tells me about the presence or absence of a particular banding pattern with a particular separation between the lines, that's the spatial frequency, and in fact a particular orientation. And if I heavily overrepresent one point in K space, then I heavily overrepresent a particular spatial frequency, a particular banding pattern. Uh, What's interesting and really neat about MR is we captured just the spatial frequencies of the underlying object, and in the absence of this little spike, all of those spatial frequencies add up just right to give me a really useful appearing image uh, through the process of what we call a Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform of my case-based data gives me the image data that we typically look at. And I, I think this is a nice example of how a single point in K-space can heavily overrepresent a particular banding pattern in the image. In the absence of that spike, you get this nice perfect blend of spatial frequencies, if you will, for that image. Uh, so we'll leave it at that this morning uh, in terms of K-space, and we'll come back and talk uh, more about K-space and fast imaging and artifacts uh, next Thursday. Thank you.